And don't think in the back of your mind, I'll accept them only if they change. But you know where I got that idea? That's how God loves us. Now, we don't think that. And I didn't think, you know, to begin with. I thought He saved me on probation. But you know, uh, it took me a long time to understand that God loved me just as I was. And He didn't save me so He could change me. He saved me because He loved me. Change is inevitable. Love is the greatest motivation for change. You'll do things for love that you wouldn't do for any other reason. You know, parents will sacrifice their own lives to save their children. I uh, heard about, we were talking about the, uh, the earthquake in China a while ago. You know, there was a tornado in, the, what was the name of that town here in Oklahoma that, uh, that devastated the town? Uh, do you all remember? Uh, Pitcher. Pitcher? Pitcher. Pitcher, yes. And I, I heard about a, a parent who, uh, of course, you know, they didn't have a good place to hide everybody. And so uh, the parent gathered up the children, put them underneath, and, and uh, the parent lost their life saving the children. Well, that's love. See, that's, a love will motivate you to do things that you wouldn't ever do for any other reason. And God loves us and accepts us just because He's that good. And He loves us knowing everything wrong in our lives. He loves us knowing everything that could be wrong. And He just keeps loving us until... We believe it until we love Him back. And when we begin to love Him back as a response to His loving us, uh, then things begin to change. Uh, let's go read this again. The obvious impossibility of carrying out such a moral program should make it plain that no one can sustain a relationship with God that way. That means by your own effort. The person who lives in right relationship with God does it by embracing what God arranges for him. Doing things for God is the opposite of entering into what God does for you. That's beautiful the way he says it here in the message. Doing things for God is the opposite of entering into what God does for you. He wants, to, uh, he wants us to walk with Him in our everyday lives in a love relationship. And He wants to convince us. And you know, by the way, it takes a little bit of convincing um, that He loves us that much. In fact, I think we need to, uh, we need to hear... Preachers need to preach it, and we need to hear it more than just once and then move on. We need to keep hearing about it all the time, that God loves us no matter what, that He accepts us no matter what, that He loves us knowing everything. See, we think these little problems, these little issues, maybe big issues, doesn't matter. We think all these things, that mistakes we make and flaws and faults and problems uh, be, become a barrier between us and God. But He knows those things. He knows about them more than you do. He knows about your problems. He knows about your issues. He knows about uh, faults and flaws. He knows more about it than we do. He knows what the roots of it are. <laughs> is. Is that our... Well, anyway, He knows what the roots <laughs> are. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, he knows why. He knows everything about it, and He loves us anyway. We need to be convinced of that. We need to know that, and that creates in us a sense of uh, security in the love of God. And I think that's important. I think we need to know that. But the thought that struck in my mind uh, last week as we were reading is that no one can sustain a relationship with God uh, by, doing it, by doing it yourself. In other words, you have to continue as a Christian by depending on the grace of God and living in the grace of God. So what I wanted to talk to you today about is the life of grace. Or it could be called the life of faith, depending on which side you're looking at it. Grace is... Uh, looking at it from God's point of view, faith looking at it from our point of view. And do you know what inspires faith more than anything else is when you uh, get a view of God's tremendous grace. We sing sometimes about His amazing grace. And it is. It's, it's bigger than we think it is. And you might think God loves you, but He loves you more than you think He does. And you might think you got an idea of His grace, but it's bigger than you think it is. And I think uh, we won't ever really understand it uh, until, we, until we get to heaven and say, wow, it was bigger than I thought it was. God loves me more than I even dreamed He did. You know, uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says that in the ages to come, He might show us the exceeding riches of His kindness towards us through Christ. So it takes a long time to get over the idea that He's just sort of reluctantly uh, accepting us into the family in one false step and He kicks us out. No, not, not so at all. Not true. Now, I'd like to read, uh, uh, if you would, back... Uh, uh, let's see, what do I want to look at first? Let's look at uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, just for a moment. The Christian life begins by responding... What I'm, the point I'm making is that we continue as Christians the same way that we begin. Uh, we begin by simply responding to an invitation from Jesus. He invites us into a relationship with Him. I'd like to read Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And if you've been coming here very long, you know that I like this verse because I, I, I read it a lot. And uh, one of my favorites. i got lots of favorites, by the way, but this is one of my favorite favorites. Um, this is an invitation of Jesus to anybody. 
uh, to anybody whosoever will. Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And notice what He says. And I will give you rest. Notice what He doesn't say. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you more work. And make it harder. He does, I'll pile more on. You thought it was hard before. Just wait. But you know, a lot of Christians, that's their experience. You know, Life is hard before they become a Christian, but then they get in church and they've just exchanged one set of problems for another set. One set of stresses for another set of stresses. It's not supposed to be that way. When we come into relationship with Jesus, He says here, if I'm reading this right, He says, you, you had a life of labor and heavy uh, burdens. If you come to Me, I'll give you rest. I'll take away those heavy burdens. Uh, the next verse says, Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. That means I'm humble. I'm, I'm not proud. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. When He says, Take My yoke upon you, He means a yoke like you harness two animals together. Like you bring them into a union, hook them together. Uh, you know, uh, luckily, uh, Troy, we don't farm that way anymore. <laughs> you know, I, and, and I never did, but I know I've seen pictures of, and I'm thankful for that. Listen, farming is hard enough the way we do it now <laughs> with the big machinery and the tractors, uh, especially for somebody like me that doesn't have a natural uh, sort of inclination towards uh, mechanical things. But uh, in, in, in earlier times, they would take animals and harness them together because when you harness two animals together, you've got the power of two rather than one. But another reason they would harness those animals together is, uh, and I've read this looking it up, the yoke is the piece of wood they put across their necks to hook two of them together. They would take an animal uh, who was experienced, who knew how to walk the path, who knew how to walk down the row, and they would take a young animal who didn't know how to do it, and they would yoke those two together. And so when the, the older animal, the experienced animal who knew how to walk, when he would walk along because he, was, he knew how to do it, the younger one would just be pulled along with him. And uh, he would learn how to walk by walking along with the, the older animal. And I think this is the idea that Jesus has in mind when He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. In other words, get hooked up with me and walk along with me. I know how to walk the walk. And if you just hook up with me in, in a relationship with me, as you walk with me, you'll learn how to walk the walk too. You see, Jesus, uh, and when He lived on earth, He was successful in His life, in His Christian life. If I could call His life the Christ life. He was successful in His life and happy. I think He was happy. I've never read in here where He had a bad day. I've never read where Jesus said, Oh no, there's the alarm clock. I can't get up today. And, you know, I've never read where He was depressed. You know, where He said, I can't wait you know, uh, to get out of this. He, he was just, He was, he, he was uh, what do I want to say, content and stable is what I want to say. He was stable and consistent in his life because he had an inner strength that brought him through it. He's got the same thing for us. And he's saying, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I'm meek, lowly in heart. You'll find rest. Notice twice now he says, rest for your souls. In other words, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm just asking you to come into a relationship with me. Let me do it. Verse 30, my yoke is easy. I've had people criticize me and be mad at me, argue with me. You're making it too easy. Look, it wasn't my idea. I was just reading in the Bible. One day I was reading in the Bible and He says, My yoke is easy. Well, that's good enough for me. You know, if Jesus says, My yoke is easy, well, then I think He means it's easy. He didn't say it's hard. He said it's easy. Now, the Christian life is hard if you're going to try to do it. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. May I be honest with you? There's only one person who can live a Christian life, and that's Christ. Amen. Uh, you know, if you're going to try to do it and imitate Him, who do you think you are? You know, let Him do it. Paul tells us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. He comes into a relationship with us because he's got it in mind that we're going to rest and he's going to work. Now, I don't mean by that. I'm speaking spiritually, see. I don't mean by that that we don't have our occupations and our jobs and things that we do. But you can be inwardly at rest while you're busy, you know, with whatever it is you have to do. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Easy and light. You like those words? I like those words. That's appealing to me. Now, let's read these same verses again from the... Message translation. Now that was pretty good. I like the King James and I could live with that. I've always liked that. But when I, when I first got the Message Bible, and this is one of the things that really sold me on it, made me excited about it, was how he translated these verses. In verse 28, beginning uh, verse 28 in the Message Translation, he says, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? I know the first time I ever read this, I thought, yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I am. <laughs> Come to think of it. You know, he's not... Yeah, well, anyway. Uh, 